thank you for thank you all for joining us at virtual abilities 11th annual international disability rights affirmation conference before we get to our next presentation a little bit about myself For almost 30 years, people online have known me as Itico. I make the joke that you can tell that I'm old because I have the luxury of having a short name. I'm a writer, political scientist, and advocate for the elderly and disabled. I have two bachelor's degrees, one in instructional technology and the other one in political science, as well as a master's in communication from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. <laughs> uh, I am visually impaired since birth, so use on-screen magnification and text-to-speech technologies. I have been a builder, scripter, and sim manager, as well as a journalist in Second Life. I used to drive in Second Life until I ran somebody over on the way to work. We became friends for many years. Thankfully, you are not here to hear me speak. This year, Virtual Ability is bringing you two presenters from the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. Dr. Kimberly Lopez is an assistant professor in the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies. She critically examines social structures and processes that reinforce difference and marginalization through qualitative research. Hannah Miller is a fourth year PhD candidate who says that her research is often situated in the nexus of leisure and disability. She has worked with people who have spinal cord and traumatic brain injuries, among others. Today, today, these two will share a presentation entitled Poised Against Ableism, Con <laughs> Contemporary Unmakings and Remakings of Disability Through Critical Disability Approaches. Their presentation aims to discuss theories and methodologies that explore systematic ableism and work to be anti-ableist. When we understand how these systems work, we have a better chance of fighting them from the inside. As always, please be respectful of our presenters and hold your questions and comments until the end of the presentation. Please mute your microphone if you are on voice and refrain from using public chat during the presentation. With that said, welcome Kim and Hannah. Thank you so much. Uh, we, on behalf of both Kim and myself, 
I uh, want to start by thanking uh, everybody that was uh, responsible for getting this conference off the ground today, um, especially Itiko for introducing us, uh, Gentle for um, showing us the ropes, as you say, and thank you for everybody behind the scenes, the transcriptionists and those involved that don't necessarily um, get the recognition deserved. Um, like Itiko said, we're here today to discuss ableism and how we might unmake and remake disability through critical disability approaches. Uh, before we get started, in the spirit of reconciliation, we begin our discussion by acknowledging the land on which this session was organized. While we are gathered together through Second Life, we feel it is important to recognize the unsurrendered and unceded land that continues to be contested on which are places of learning, resting, care, leisure, employment, and other practices of living were established and prematurely taken away from many indigenous peoples. The city of La Crosse, Wisconsin, from which I come to you today, occupies land that was once a prairie that was home to a band of Ho-Chunk. In 1830, President Andrew Jackson signed the Indi Indian Removal Act in an attempt to forcibly and often violently remove indigenous peoples from their ancestral land located east of the Mississippi River to occupy territory west of the river. Throughout the 1830s and 1840s, the federal government conducted a series of six attempts to forcibly remove local Ho-Chunk by a steamboat via the Mississippi River to reservations in Iowa, northern Minnesota, southwest Minnesota, South Dakota, and finally to Nebraska. The historic steamboat landing uh, where this took place is now Riverside Park in downtown La Crosse. Thanks so much, Hannah, and for everybody. Um, so, such a pleasure to be here today with all of you. Um, sounds like we have a few Wisconsinites in the room, so we're in, we're in good company. Um, so we're, a little bit about where I'm from. Uh, since regional amalgamation, Scarborough, the lands on which I live and I'm sharing with you today was designed, uh, designated part of Toronto. Uh, Selena Mills and Sarah Rock write that Toronto itself is a word that originates from the Mohawk word Takaranto, meaning the place in the water where the trees are standing, which is said to refer to the wooden stakes that were used as fishing weirs. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, just having a... <clears throat> uh, as fishing weirs in the narrows of the local river, river systems by the Haudenosaunee and Huron-Wendat folks. The Toronto Purchase Treaty was one of many environmentally and culturally exploitative land agreements that were made across Turtle Island in which all so-called agreements were actually in fact in the best interests of the settlers. So uh, as settlers and arrivals of this land, uh, this recognition of the contributions and historic importance of Indigenous peoples must also be clearly and overtly to our uh, collective commitment to the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation in our communities. Uh, pictured here on your screen um, in the PowerPoint is the Rouge River, which is considered a part of Toronto Carrying Place Trail, a portaging route um, to the Holland River, linking Lake Ontario to Lake Simcoe. All of us here know that um, caring and caring for one another is a really political act, an act that is one of solidarity and community making. Uh, caring is what enables our future generations and our connections to ancestry. It is all of our responsibility um, in speaking to and through ableism um, or against ableism to take care of this land for our fellow humans and non-humans in seeking difficult truths and facilitating reconciliation in solidarity with First Peoples. And so in real life, these this is us. And uh, I acknowledge I might have been talking too fast, uh, so I will try to slow down here as we move forward. We'd like to start by laying out our intentions for this presentation today. We hope to do three main things. First, uh, 
we want to discuss theories and methodologies that expose systemic ableism and work to be anti-ableist. Second, uh, we'll be drawing on viral social cultural movements to invite discussions on liberation movements that intentionally speak with and through intersectional disability. And finally, we touch on some tensions and cautions for moving forward uh, carefully, emphasis on care, towards futures that enact disability justice. And while Itiko mentioned to save questions to the end, we hope that this presentation is more of a discussion and we feel it, it would be best for folks who have questions or comments uh, throughout the presentation to go ahead and voice them in chat um, we will do our best to keep up to questions and uh, we'll help each other answer those as we move through the presentation. So in um, seeking liberation and in thinking through uh, and about ableism, uh, we reflect on the existing template of living. Uh, and consider the following um, quote in relation to disabled folks or folks who are disabled. The quote reads, uh, people are free to be regardless of their ability to fit into capitalist institutions. Being uh, refers to the ability to exist and move about the world without cumbersome expectations and assumptions apart from failed attempts at inclusion um, hyper visibility, invisibility that often happen simultaneously, and marginalization. Um, and what feels like the need to critique systems that limit one's ability to participate fully in society. Capitalism uh, is an exploitative force, as we know, that attaches these signifiers of worth to individuals who commodify bodies. So their bodies and bodies of others to advance the agenda of production. Ableism, racism, sexism, colonialism, neoliberalism, these are all um, apparatuses of capitalism um, which render fat, old, mad, disabled, ill, divergent, black, uh, indigenous, of color, trans, queer bodies, and other, other, and other other bodies, uh, useless or of less use. We might dare to seek liberation through our different bodies, rather from liberation from our bodies, simply because the system says we should. Um, in an ideal world, our being. Uh, should be divorced from the very capitalist institutions that Pibna Samsara Sinha refers to, the author who was quoted on that slide. And being should always feel free. However, this is in part why we're all gathered here today um, to discuss how we might facilitate rights and freedoms uh, to be for everyone amidst um, liberal expectations to be in capitalism. So because we are leisure scholars um, here today uh, who are interested in notions of activities and time and states of mind and resistances um, that forward the very, you know, embodied experience of freedoms, we ask that you take some time to think about and um, reflect on and maybe even share your thoughts on the question, when do we feel most free? You're welcome to write your answer on a note card or share with all of us in the chat or even keep your thoughts to yourself. Um, we hope to give you about a minute and a half to think through this. And uh, in the meantime, we can share some uh, soft music during this time. So if you like quiet, please feel free to um, turn down um, the volume or mute your, um, mute your speakers. And we'll indicate um, in the chat um, what it, uh, when we're back to discussion. So we'll start that now.
Okay. Thanks for taking that time to um, think about that question. I know we often don't think about, um, you know, when we feel most free often. So it's kind of nice to dip into that imagining of um, self in times when we're feeling free. So if you're okay with um, it, folks in the chat who have um, contributed, I'd be happy to, I'm happy to read out some of your responses. Um, and feel free to raise your hand or indicate that you'd like to speak to it more if, if you're wanting to contribute in that way. So gentle, you say I'm freer when I'm out in nature, around people, and uh, freedom to have or share ideas, free in the presence of open, uh, open hearts. That's lovely. Yep, safety, therefore not invisible. Great. And, you know, when um, somebody mentioned that um, when they feel, when they have security, um, you know, food security, financial security, safety, then one feels that they're able to create freely in that moment. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, I similarly also feel free when I feel safe and I feel heard and I feel part of community. Um, and I feel that I have resources that can help me through some of um, what whatever challenges I might be facing. That's when I feel the most free. So Hannah, we can flip to the next slide. Great. Many of her for contributing to that. So to kind of um, frame our understanding of disability for some of our later discussions, um, we consider some of these constructs that we've internalized, or um, what I call embodiments, um, and reflect on the different ways that we um, engage in one another through um, the various mediums that construct our identity or influence our identity. Um, so with credit to Whitney Stark, we employ the term inter intra-action to refer to the ways we, we feel social and other forces are engaged to shape uh, various knowings. Um, intra-action is a term by Barad that talks about um, how pr bodies are pre-established um, and that participate in action with each other. And intra-action understands that agency uh, is not to, um, sorry about that, that understands agency is not apart from the structures that we are a part of. So there is um, uh, less of a separation between, you know, actor and uh, object and environment. All of these things are working um, together and there is uh, almost a impossibility of uh, objectivity. So an example of interaction for me was when I was learning the Second Life interface. It was an experience of reckoning with my physical container, really. Um, human, animal, mythical, mystical, more than human, and everything in between. There were new cultural and social and virtual infrastructures. And, you know, simply being in the space uh, where we relate to one another a little bit differently than we would, quote unquote, in real life. So showing up even feels different here. There are different expectations and norms and language. Um, and in what we understand or what's been talked about as uh, bodies of difference in real life, the virtual art, cosplay, leisure, and other mediums facilitate some sort of a departure from these standard in real life expectations to show up in a particular way. Um, so, for example, in a conventional conference setting, the expectation is to show up put together 
and professional, quote unquote, which are often contingent on an assumed baseline of social and economic capital and standards that are much more attainable if you are able, white, straight, excuse the phone ringing in the background, cis, English speaking, and youthful. The image on the slide, we see, uh, we see a cartoon illustration of uh, a person placing their head through a computer screen with a uh, troll's face emerging from the other side. We know that um, while folks might be afforded opportunities to show up differently through mediums like social media, LARPing, cosplay, theater, and art, allowing for newer and perhaps even more free expressions of self, the ways we can become disembodied by these mediums creates uh, new avenues for vulnerability. So um, there is a crossed out uh, term on your screen there, and um, this uh, technique is called suratur, or writing under erasure, and this is originally coined by uh, two philosophers, Heidegger and borrowed by Derrida, um, and it describes the way we can acknowledge language or processes as inadequate but necessary. So methodology supplies the roadmap for data generation and research. We can also see methodology as a mechanism that is rooted in discovery and colonial practices of seeking, retrieving, and owning knowledge in sometimes exploitative ways. So in the spirit of open access to knowledge, the abolition of gatekeeping and one way of doing inquiry, we um, place methodology under erasure with the understanding that there are a multitude of, multitude of ways to know ableism, disability, and critique systems that produce and reproduce oppression through disablement. So here we're talking about um, a, a set of critical disability theories. And we believe that critical disability theory activates justice by uh, critiquing discourse and interrogating binaries. So the literature talks about uh, language and the practice of binaries. So it's, and, and what we're talking about here is simply a starting point for uh, critiquing language that um, perpetuates uh, uh, frames that work to disable individuals. So apologies in advance if any of the information is over-explanatory or an oversimplification of a very nuanced and complex experience of disabled life on the binary. So, of course, we know that person with a disability takes up person-first language to describe a person affected by a disability. However, um, this position of disability in relation to the body um, might be seen as less preferable uh, as it considers a person to be apart from a quote-unquote impairment that society disables them through. The disability experience is that of one lives as disabled. So while person-first language was the standard observance for many decades, it's important to reflect on how this practice is changing um, and how a disabled person prefers to identify themselves. Similarly, um, ability versus disability highlights that disabled persons live with quote-unquote strengths that should be highlighted over the disability and should not as strongly be attended to as the strengths that society has normalized. 
Here the counter argument is that the dis always lies in limitations of you know the ableist structural environment and that disability should be used in place of differently abled or other erasures of disability. There is a binary called the heroism despair binary which speaks to the ways um, disabled individuals are heralded or glorified over able-bodied and or neurotypical counterparts for navigating everyday life so um, and or conversely patronizingly pitied for living everyday life as a disabled person and so the last um, binary that we um, want to talk about is this kind of social community approach um, to care versus the uh, biomedical approach to disability and particularly um, as health researchers were often positioned uh, against one another uh, in care directed at disabled persons by that I mean you know social community approaches focus on uh, tackling the environment the lack of accommodations right um, so the, uh, the environment in which the flower grows from taking from the previous speaker's uh, comment, um, as opposed to fixing in an individual, fixing in, in air quotes right, right now. Um, and um, critical um, disability asks those to use it to be mindful of language, voice, uh, responsibility, accountability, this citizenship, and disempowerment, um, and the evolving uh, connectedness of disability in conceptual landscapes. So on the slide that's on your screen currently, I'll be making uh, reference to a range of critical disability theories. Um, I'm, I'll ask uh, Hannah to pop the reference into the chat of um, of the resource where the resource that's um, um, supporting us today. We think that uh, critical disability theory um, activates justice through theory propagation, so that when disability is understood as a medical condition. Uh, that prescribes an individual to a limited social reality, there is little recognition of the ways in which environment, so physical space, attitudes, and barriers, and discourse that disempowers. Thankfully, um, critical disability theory informs um, how we understand disability, spurring several movements, and uh, ways of thinking to enhance the visibility of disability and disabled life and living. So um, the first one on your screen is Crip Theory, which is founded on the work of Robert McRuer, who attends to the coming out cultures of queerness and disability. And they speak to the ways that the body is articulated through these identifiers and how queerness and disability configure to inform one another um, among other you know axes of social significance and um, the crip of color uh, is an inaction of crip theory with race considerations right disability justice as many of you know here is a movement built on the work by Patty Byrne Mia Mingus, Stacey Milburn, Leroy Moore, Leah Lakshmi, uh, Peepsna Samsara Sinha, and others. It's um, credited for stretching disability um, to consider the collective values, um, the multiple oppressions, and the need for solidarity. Um, the tenets of disability justice are, um, by sins invalid are described at the website um, that will be put into the chat in a moment 
So Skulk talks about um, disability as methodology, which builds on disability justice movements and theorizations by women of color. It's a method of analysis of how we've come to understand um, a disability over the object of analysis, <clears throat> the disab disability, the disabled body itself. Um, so speaking uh, those two things as separate and also um, interacting in that way, interactive in that way. And the last um, bullet point on the slide is, excuse me, my voice is a little bit waning, is the Crip of Color critique, which is a critique in action of oppressive state forces through disabled bodies that are entangled with race, gender, sexuality, etc., to engage more extensively with questions of state-sanctioned violence. We know that this is uh, an ongoing discussion in our world today. So <clears throat> such an engagement would shift our understanding of disability from a noun, so a minority identity to be claimed, to a verb the state-sanctioned disablement of a racialized and impoverished community via resource deprivation, um, who are also identifiable um, as precarious uh, populations by poor. So these critical theories that help us frame how um, frame radical inquiry and uh, help move us to a liberatory pra uh, praxis and resistance towards more just futures. And if there are others in the audience who are, you know, inquirers of disability theory, we would love to hear um, from you about other theories that are helpful for centering uh, disability in research and community organizing. We're happy to hear a few examples if anybody would like to share in the chat or by identifying yourself as wanting to share in conversation here now. Thank you, Gentle. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Gentle says, I like to think as, as abled and being based rather than as disabled. That this comes from outside us. Thanks so much for that, Gentle. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a construct that's applied to us rather than you know, us designating for ourselves. Itiko says, growing up, I was always told what I can't do, not what I can do. Thank you so much for sharing that, Itiko. You were told what you can't do as opposed to what you can do. So focusing on the, you know, the impairment focus as opposed to a strength-based focus, right? Right. And High Sky says sometimes the issue comes from within a community, kind of quote unquote crowd theory. When someone is able to find a way to reach their goals and they try to share that with others who quote unquote drag them down, 
uh, instead of being lift up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, facing change, even when positive, is sometimes resisted. Right. And sometimes it can be a comparative thing, like who gets certain accommodations versus who doesn't, who is prioritized in a certain environment and who's not, who then is made invisible as a result of that visibility, uh, as a result of those um, accommodations and so on. Thank you so much. We'll continue to hear out some examples um, in the chat as we move along as well. And I, I did see a question earlier on in the presentation um, that we can get to at the end of the at the end of the talk, um, for sure. Thanks so much. So on your screen now, um, there are a number of different um, methods and methodologies for pursuing disability justice work. Um, that should say narrative and ethnography. So things like biography, auto ethnography, talking about our own experiences and our own relationships in the world. So uh, unmaking and remaking and doing dis undoing disability um, through critical narrative inquiry, like analysis of narrative, a narrative analysis, braided narratives, community narratives, anti-narrative with an E and anti-narrative with an I. There are lots of different tools that we can use to come together and hear out one another's experiences um, through through uh, storytelling. Um, there's a lot of examples in community too where um, we create supportive circles and do a go around and hear of one another's experience on a certain topic related to disability. Um, and this is a way of sharing through narrative as well. Through the arts, we have um, you know methods like, body mapping and space mapping and you know um, mapping one's community and so on we have opportunities to create self-portraits how we choose to be seen in the world um, and and ways of going through uh, of using art to um, express beyond representation so there is a lot of tokenism that's happening in the world today because of the social movements that are um, kind of surging. And while that's, um, in some respects, not the tokenism part, but representation is really great, we see that um, there's a need to kind of move beyond that and instead focus on expressions of self that exist beyond a body that's relegated to specific categories. Um, sometimes a checkbox system is not helpful for, you know, identities and um, making sure we can locate everybody in a certain space. <clears throat> and of course, the digital, digital ethnographies, case studies, hearing what people are saying on social media, because that uh, changes so rapidly. And pedagogy, the way we teach and learn from one another, um, that too is a methodology. We think we can hear um, about upstream um, approaches. So the previous speaker talked about children's storybooks, which is an incredibly upstream approach. You know, we shape children's minds now, so they make good decisions and create healthy relations in the future to create anti-ableist spaces. Um, <clears throat> in our learning and teaching, we should provide multimodal experiences and various um, material engagements. There are lots of different ways we can learn through our senses. Um, and teachers and learners should be providing experiences for each other to do that. There are also in uh, interpretive assignments with flexible feedback mechanisms, sometimes deadlines and strict rules about criteria are not helpful in uh, structuring assignments. Um, and we should provide some flexibility there. If there are other methods that you find are useful for co-activating or mobilizing through towards disability justice, please feel free to share those in the chat as well. Um, we're going to 
continue moving on, but we're going to collect some of your um, some of your ways of engagement and other methodologies that you're finding useful in your own life for disability justice um, to share with others in this community. Conferences. <laughs> Thanks, gentle. Yeah, for sure. Um, Hannah, if you could flip to the next slide, that'd be great. Thanks so much. So as we begin to wrap up our talk, we see that the implications for knowing disability through critical theories and methodologies to be really great. We see these opportunities for co-design, uh, upstream thinking, like I mentioned, a continual renewal of disability language and culture. You know this language is changing every day. Um, so it's important that we you know, continue to offer ways to shape that knowledge and uh, language and culture um, and ways for critique and resistance. However, we're also reminded of the ways that we must be cautious as we space make uh, and move through new territories of inclusion. With that said, we want to take a few minutes to talk about some tensions and cautions, and this is by no means inclusive. Um, however, we feel it's important um, and kind of, I understand it as a sort of balancing act uh, between, in the most, um, in most cases, between uh, like real world and uh, digital worlds. So some of these things we talked about earlier as when we feel most free can also uh, open the door for uh, vulnerabilities in digital spaces and places. Uh, one thing we would like to highlight is the anonymity that occurs in these places. So while um, remaining anonymous in, in spaces online, such as Reddit, 4chan, uh, Twitter, uh, Second Life to an extent, uh, might benefit those who seek other identities to feel more free. It also welcomes uh, griefers. I saw that in the chat. Um, people who look to capitalize or benefit from doing harm as identifying as those with marginalized identities. Uh, we see people like trolls in virtual worlds and spaces. Um, we see instances of catfishing, uh, especially with relationships and um, deceptive personas in general. Uh, I think all these are, are cautions uh, while thinking about these spaces that are often liminal or between, uh, for instance, real life and digital worlds. So liminal spaces are great for unmaking disability and having opportunities to remake disability if one chooses. Um, but these spaces are often unregulated, unstructured, uh, blurry rules, and so forth. So it can be dangerous at the same time. Uh, these spaces can be places of harm, exploitation, etc. So. At the same time where these digital worlds might be a place of ablement, uh, these spaces also are, are cautioned places of disablement for people wishing to do harm. In leisure, uh, this, is, this is interesting and a topic of study. I just wanna to touch on one article by Leyland and colleagues in 2018. They talked about Pokemon Go and how the the pokey stops were often in uh, wealthy white affluent neighborhoods uh, which made it uh, discriminatory towards folks who didn't live in those neighborhoods and also subject to uh, stereotypes and racial bias for those uh, wishing to play pokemon go in public places that should be accessible to all and for all people. So we see examples in leisure. Uh, when we think about 
things like universal health care. Um, I saw some people were from Canada, uh, but in the U.S. we have a very different uh, health care system. So uh, Kim wanted me to talk on how universal health care doesn't always mean uh, for all. So while universal health care might mean the freedom to have health care, it doesn't always mean the freedom from uh, necess necessities like transportation, uh, the rurality of living spaces, uh, overcoming financial barriers and other things that make it hard for universal health care uh, to be accessible. And I think we see that uh, within disability rights activist groups. So while places might be accessible, uh, sometimes adaptive equipment can be expensive uh, to say the least. Uh, so we recognize that it's it's not only the, the freedom to these places, but it's also the freedom from some of these other structures that uh, prevent us from accessing these, these spaces. Great, thanks Hannah. Um, so we share our inspirations, possibilities, and imaginations here in our last slide in cultivating careful liberatory futures. We're inspired by um, movements like Rest as Resistance uh, by the NAP Ministry, who talk about you know disengaging from um, work by resting ourselves and our bodies um, because our bodies are inherently made to labor. Um, I'm also interested, and Hannah is also interested and inspired by these recent shifts in the labor movement that emphasize escaping capitalism. Um, so the quiet quitting movement, you know, um, the great resignation, you know, focusing less on structures that kind of pigeonhole us to perform through our bodies in specific ways. Um, the abolition movement and the criminal justice system, um, where we seek to destruct systems that are no longer serving us. Um, also, um, some possibilities include, um, you know, continuing to critique uh, identification and the removal of those limiting systems and structures. We can work to center care in everything that we do. We can work to retool our conceptual frames to be better informed by disability advocates and uh, experiences of disability towards um, disability justice. Uh, in, in our imaginations, we would love to see a world in which our um, in which justice and freedom are realized. If you think back to the experiences and feelings of when you feel most free, um, we should collectively seek and support ways to replicate uh, or infuse or be inspired by those embodiments um, wherever and however we choose to show up in everyday life. So imagine spaces in real life that could feel free always. Um, we strive and en envision for that. Um, so by critiquing these mechanisms um, of disablement, we're pursuing justice through the enablement of freedom. So thanks so much for your time today. We appreciate all of your contributions in the chat. And uh, if you've um, asked a, us a question specifically in the chat, please feel free to repost it. Um, and we'd be happy to answer that now. Um, yeah, happy to take any of your comments as well. Thanks for your participation and your attention. This is gentle. I'm amazed by Shay's varieties of popcorn. Um, thank you so much, uh, Hannah and Kimberly. That's that's just been a wonderful session. Um, uh, Kimberly, you mentioned early on uh, that uh, talking about failed attempts at inclusion. Isn't the fact that an attempt was made a positive step, even if it fails? Yes, it is. Um, um, some, some. I, I agree with you. It is a positive step, even if it fails. 
Um, sometimes we can become hardened by repeated attempts and a lot of saying and not doing and a lot of, you know, um, kind intentions and well-to-dos, but no actual movement towards um, inclusion and space making. So uh, I just wanted to recognize folks' frustrations with sometimes um, policies that don't do enough or um, hearsay, or sorry, um, kind of administrative speak that doesn't go far enough um, and recognizing folks' uh, frustrations with that um uh with falling short in those realms so absolutely failed attempts at inclusion are steps in the right direction for acknowledgement recognition and visibility but absolutely i'm also wanting to be mindful or thought or sensitive to folks who are feeling um somewhat calloused by those repeated um shortfalls in action Thanks for the question. What do you suggest about that? The uh, how should we deal with the shortfalls? <laughs> that's a that's a really difficult question uh, to answer. Um, and Hannah, please, oh, I welcome you to um, uh, contribute to this discussion for sure. Uh, yeah, I think um, if we're if we're really wanting to hear folks with living, uh, uh, you know, living with disabled experiences. Um, then, like, we need to put meaningful action intention to following through on the structures that disable. So, um, while we can put out a survey, and that's nice, and we hear folks' frustrations with certain things, sometimes they're kind of left into considerations and not kind of mobilized in a way that's meaningful to make, cha make change actually happen. Whether it, because it's resources that are not available or you know, uh, the planning, the planning piece isn't, <clears throat> you know, readily accessible. There are so many reasons, and sometimes I would even say excuses as to why these things aren't put into action. But um, I would say, you know, if we're, if we're going to create attempts, then make sure that we have the ability to kind of mobilize these um, attempts at inclusion from start to finish. And also to comment on that, I think I spend a lot of my time educating folks on accessibility and the various forms of disability and how accessibility is not just uh, for folks who have mobility impairments, but it's also for visual impairments. Um, we look at, especially in parks, um, visual uh, interpretive signs to help communicate uh, what it is uh, that's that's being, uh, I guess, demonstrated in parks or shown in parks. So I, th I think it goes goes further with education, and I think that might be a, a starting point as well. And I don't think it's just one thing we need to work on. Um, I think there's many things that are kind of entangled. So you look at the structures and the financial um, constraints of capitalism and the marginalization of folks. I think if we slowly chip away at you know each each piece. Uh, hopefully progress will be made. So it's certainly a uh, failed attempt in, at inclusion is, is certainly great. Uh, however, as everybody knows, full inclusion is super hard. And uh, I think we're always kind of working towards that. Thank you. There's a question from Pecos. Anonymity is interesting in SL and similar spaces. Our avatars are our avatars are anonymous in that they don't reveal our real world identity, yet they are persistent and so can establish reputation. So really it's just a comment. Yeah, I've found virtual spaces fascinating uh, when talking about identities and what is possible. I think to say uh, briefly, uh, I think also, this raises questions of ethics and values uh, with with identities and how we present ourselves in online spaces. So, um, I think this is a whole another conversation. But I, I would be more than happy to talk about this in, in, in more depth at another time. Itko um, says. 
I was walking with city planners the other day doing a walk audit, and I made the point that some of the changes that help the disabled help non-disabled people at least with sidewalks. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, steps towards inclusion don't only support folks um, who have disability or who, you know, disabled folks. It's it's something that supports justice for everybody, like any other justice movement on like racism and ageism. We create a better, uh, stronger, caring society when we advance on all fronts, um, I believe, for sure. Um, to Pesco's point, too, I think um, we create social a different sort of social capital through digital spaci- spaces, social media even, in addition to online, even gaming uh, interfaces, um, places like Second Life and so on. So for sure, there's a tendency or perhaps the possibility of reproducing similar or like oppressions in these spaces as well. So while they can be very liberating for some, they can also be um, uh, disabling for others, for sure. Thank you for that comment. It points out that everyone drives badly in SL. <laughs> I certainly am so sorry to an audience member that I might have um, stepped on as I was walking towards the front of the room here. So I'm still getting my SL legs, um, so to speak. So appreciate um, all of your you know, kindness and generosity in, as we learn this platform. Thanks so much again for the opportunity to be here, and we look forward to the um, conversations in the next sessions, but please feel free to reach out if you ever want to take up this conversation some more. Um, great, great, great conversation. Appreciate it so much. I see one more comment from iSky. A university in Ohio noticed how the students didn't really use the sidewalks they laid out, but they saw the paths that many students' feet had created crisscrossing grassy areas. They created sidewalks over those paths, and it was well received by the students. Yes, oftentimes, you know, we take the path that um, is the most direct one, and that's often through the the grass that's less constructed. Um, and so that is in itself speaks volumes about how we need to kind of direct the ways that we need to go um, to better suit our needs as well. Thanks for that. Yes, thank you. And I think it also speaks to like this redundancy that we often see in universal design. So having multiple options to do multiple things, to get multiple places in different ways. Um, I think by having this and I think we can more inclusive to more folks. So that's a great point. Yes, thank you. I do want to remind the audience you can get a resource list from our two speakers in the box on the stage. All you have to do is click the box and you'll get a note card with those references. 